crowd of kids going back today. Very simple for that. If you will take your Bibles uh, to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, we've been uh, we've been studying uh, studying through this passage. Now remember, um, the uh, the theme for this passage is righteousness. God wants you and I to walk in righteousness. Okay, He wants us to be the Christians. He wants us to be. You know, we so often walk and live how we want. And God says, No, if you're a child of God, you need to be walking with me. And in Romans chapter 8, we're going to look at, time willing, we're going to look at Romans chapter 8, uh, part of Romans chapter 8 today. Um, but it just talks about that, that battle that's within us. That battle between the flesh and the spirit. And if we're not walking in the spirit, then we're walking in the flesh. And if we're walking in the flesh, then how can we say that we're a child of God? Okay, And, and there's all these things that, uh, that we see here in this text. And, um, but, um, but I want us to consider here today that if we're going to walk righteously, we need to not only have a righteousness that is greater than the Pharisees, and we saw that in chapter 5, um, down through the end of the chapter, and he gives six examples of that. Um, but then in chapter 6, he says, listen, if you're going to walk righteously, you need to walk in a way that pleases God. And he says the first way to please God is by serving Him His way, not our way. We want to serve God our way. God, I'm going to do it my way. No, it's not about your way. It's about God's way. It's about being submissive to Him, and it's about doing it, uh, doing it His way. And, uh, you know, we, we, we said, and if you remember, I said that each one of these examples deal with this idea of motive. What is your motive behind serving God? Okay, same with prayer. Lord, Lord we, we want to come to you in prayer. But have you ever sat in prayer meeting? Have you sat, ever sat in a time of prayer and you think to yourself, why are we telling God what to do? Lord, Lord, heal this person, and Lord, do this, and Lord, do that, and, and Lord, uh, Lord, work here, and Lord, work there. You know, God is already at work. I don't have to tell God what to do. Okay? So what is our prayer like? How do we pray? What, what is our motive behind prayer? Is prayer something that I go to the Lord and I say, Lord, I'm going to pray to you so I can get it. You know, I hear all the time people tell me, you know, well, I, I, I'm a Christian, I pray. So what do you pray you know, most people's prayers, if you listen to them, are, Lord, what can I get out of you? What can I get from you? That's not what prayer is. And here Jesus says, listen, if we're going to have a prayer life that is pleasing to God, you need to do certain things. And, and remember last week we talked about this, and we, we didn't get all the way through, and we talked about the publicity prayer. It's all about me. Look what I've done. Look who I am. Look how much better I am than everybody else. And that was exactly what the Pharisees did. We saw that in verse, in verse 5. Okay, in verse 6, we talked about a private prayer. That private prayer of going into your prayer closet and praying. And I said, that's the way God wants us to, to be. God wants us to quietly go and pray to Him. It's not about shouting from the mountaintops. It's not about... And then we talked about the pagans' prayer. Remember the pagan prayer? And then it was like the heathens do. And what do the heathens do? They, they're constantly re repeating. There's, you know, and, and the word of God says, be careful of vain repetition. Re repetition. I'm not saying that we ought, we ought not to continue to pray for things. Because there are times where God says, listen, Randy, you need to continue praying. I haven't answered yet, so continue praying. But we have to be careful that there's no this vain repetition where it loses its meaning. That's what that, the Word of God says. That's what the heathens do. And then today, I want us to look at the, um, at the fourth type of prayer. And I've called it the proper prayer. Or um, the, um, the, um, you know, the, 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 the model prayer. If you want to use a different word, but the model prayer. Jesus says, listen, I'm going to teach you what to, how to pray. And we all know the model prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I, I don't personally... I could probably sit here if I thought about it and say it from memory, but I don't have it memorized because I'm not one who says, I'm going to say the Lord's Prayer over and over and over and over and over again. Why? Because I believe then it becomes vain repetition. Yeah. And it loses its meaning. But there's some key thoughts in this prayer that I believe every Christian should have in our prayer life. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about Pleasing God through this proper prayer. 
But before we start, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you're doing. Lord, I pray that it would not be my words, but it would be your words. Lord, you move upon the people here today, and you challenge us with regards to prayer. Help our prayer life be more than just about me or about vain repetition. But Lord, in the quietness and the silence of, a, of our bedroom or in the quietness and silence of our water closet or in the silence and the quietness of our living room, Lord, help us to bring our petitions and our requests before you. And I love what Paul says, that when we bring our requests and petitions with thanksgiving, then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus. So Lord, I ask that, Lord, you would just help us learn to pray the way we ought to be praying. Lord, I do thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just heard my phone ding, so I figured I'd better turn it off. <laughs> um, here in our text, I want us to, uh, to consider several things here today. You know, Jesus is talking about, again, he goes back to motives, and he says, okay, what's your motive for prayer? Why are we praying? And he gives, I believe he gives three reasons here um, why we should be praying. Okay, the first reason, and you have this on your, uh, on your outline, and I did bring my outline with me. Hold on, let me get that. Um, or if you notice, I put the, again, I put the outlines on here. We're in the process of redoing our projector, and uh, hopefully it will be brighter, but uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to get rid of the outlines. I think everybody seems to be enjoying uh, the outlines and able to take notes. Um, but um, the, uh, the, the first thing we see with regards to this model prayer, this proper prayer, is that we pray to glorify God. Our prayer ought to be to glorify God. Look what it says if you will, in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And if you look at verse, starting with verse, uh, not, uh, verse 9, it says this, In this manner, therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Here in these two verses, we find three things that I believe is very important as we glorify God. Number one, that if we're going to glorify God in our prayers, we have to remember that our prayer is a relational prayer. It's a relational prayer. And what do I mean by that? Well, the Word of God says that it's to our Heavenly Father. It's not to a God that's out there somewhere. It's not to somebody that doesn't know us. But it's somebody that knows us intimately, that knows us personally, that has every hair on our head counted, that knows our every need, that knows our need before we even request the need, but he still says, as. That's our Heavenly Father. It's just like me as a father knowing my kids. I know what my kids need. And you know, sometimes my kids don't always like what I tell them they need. My son was one who could, uh, who could live very happily, okay, on, uh, on, and, and I've said this before, but he could live very happily on a Mountain Dew and Ding Dong for breakfast. He could, uh, he could, skip, he could skip lunch and for dinner he'd be very happy with either a, a French fries and chicken, uh, chicken fingers that is, not, uh, not you know, a, a fancy chicken, but chicken, uh, chicken fingers and fries or a cheese steak or something like that. He would be happy to live his whole life that way. And we said, no, Josh, that is not how you know, you're going to grow. That's not how you're going to you know, be healthy. You need to eat your vegetables. I don't like vegetables. You know, I don't want vegetables. Then, you know, well, you're going to sit here until you eat your vegetables. Well, you're not being a real nice father. Well, I don't care if, you're not being, if I'm not being a real nice father. I know what's best for you. You're going to eat your vegetables. And if you don't eat it for, for dinner tonight, you'll have them tomorrow morning for breakfast before you go to school. Um, you know, no, well, you know, and, and finally we get his vegetables down. Why? Because parents understand what we need to do to help the kids grow. God does the same thing for us. God knows what's best for us. He really does. But why does he do that? Because he's our father. 
He's our creator. He's our maker. He knows us intimately. He knows who we are. And the Word of God tells us that He is our Heavenly Father. And what a blessing to know that God is a God who cares for me and He loves me. And even while I was yet sinners, he, and while I was yet a sinner, He still loved, he loved me and died for me. Now, now, take your Bibles, if you will, to Romans chapter 8. I said we were going to go to Romans chapter 8. You know, as you go to Romans chapter 8, a question I, I asked myself, and I wanted us to be able to answer fairly clearly today, is, um, is how do we have this relationship with God? What does it mean to have a relational uh, prayer life with God? What does it mean to look at God as our Heavenly Father? Well, the Word of God tells us in Romans chapter 8, and actually Romans chapter 6 through 8, then our is a great, great chapters to read. If you have some time, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, because in, in, in Romans chapter 6, we have in verse 23, we're all, you know, for all have sinned, come short of the glory. No, sorry. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Talking about our salvation and the need of salvation. And, and I do not know, brethren, in chapter 7, that those, um, you know, that, uh, that, that the law has dominion over man as long as he lives. You know, and it's, he, he takes the law and starts looking at the law and saying, hey, the law points us to our sinfulness. Why? Because you and I can't keep the law. We can be as good as we want, but the Word of God makes it very clear that our righteousnesses, our good deeds, anything we do, our filthy rags before God, we can't be good enough to be saved before God. And the law points to that. Why? Because I can't keep the law. You know, if God says, listen, there's ten commandments I want to give you. Ten commandments. Exodus chapter, you know, you know the chapter 20, if I'm not mistaken, gives you the list of ten commandments. Ten commandments I give you. I can guarantee you between today and next week, you will have broken at least one of those ten commandments before the end of the day is done. Because none of us can keep it. And the law is this picture and this help is this help for us to understand that we cannot be saved on our own. And so we come to chapter 8. In chapter 8, verse 1, it says this, and it's talking again about our relationship with God. There is therefore now no condemnation with God. What, what, you know, what, what, why don't we have condemnation? Look up to verse 25 of chapter 7. In verse 25 of chapter 7, it says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then that the mind... Uh, that, the, that with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So we need to understand what Paul's dealing with. Is he's dealing with this idea that Jesus Christ is the one who took, the, who, who fulfilled the law, took the penalty of sin. He took our sin upon himself and gave us righteousness. Because we could not do that ourselves. And then in, in, chat, in verse 1 he says, Therefore... There is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say to those that attend North Chester Baptist Church. It doesn't say to those that are good. It doesn't say to those that are born into a Christian family. It doesn't say to those that are born into a Christian nation. It doesn't say, it says to those that are in Christ Jesus. To those who have called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want, you, you want a verse to go with that, go over to chapter 10 of Romans. In chapter 10 of Romans, in verse 9, it tells us this, that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our hearts that God has raised Him from the dead, it says you will, not you might, but you will be saved. Amen. Now I want us to understand something. <coughs> this verse says if we confess with our mouth. We're not talking about a confessional here. We're not talking about me going to you know, one of our my deacons and saying, listen, I want to tell you all the bad things I did this, this, today. It's not what it's talking about. It's talking about understanding and proclaiming with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is King of Kings. He was perfect. That He died for my sins as according to Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, talks about what the gospel is. That He died according to Scripture, was buried according to Scripture, and He rose again according to Scripture. That He took that penalty of my sin away, that I could be righteous. I need to be able to recognize who He is and who I am. I need to be able to confess that, yes, I cannot do that myself. There are many people who think, hey, I can do this. No, you can't. There's no way you can save yourself. Right. The Word of God tells us that. 
And my friends, the Word of God tells us that if I confess Jesus Christ, who He is and what He has done, what He has done for me, because I couldn't do it, because I'm a sinner. He says, and believe on your heart. You know, a lot of people believe. Let me tell you something. Even Satan believes. Oh, Satan believes? Yes, the Word of God says Satan believes. He believes that Jesus is the Son of God. I think you need to understand that Jesus, you need to believe that Jesus personally died for you. He personally was buried for you and he personally rose again for you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus took that penalty for you? Have you told other people, when I lead somebody to the Lord, when I, when, when I help somebody understand in Scripture, listen, I don't save anybody. Okay, but I can point them in Scripture and I can say, this is what the Word of God says about your sin. This is what the Word of God says about the penalty of sin, which is death. And, and, and the Word of God says now, you have a choice. You have a choice to accept Him or you have a choice to deny Him. If you accept Him, the Word of God says He gives you eternal life. If you deny Him, the Word of God says, you have eternal life too. Really? You have eternal life? Yeah, the Word of God says you're going to spend eternal life either with God or without God. So it's your choice right now. Who are you going to spend eternal life with? And so when somebody says, hey, I want to spend eternal life with God, how do I do that? I said, now you need to confess with your mouth, you need to recognize you're a sinner, and, you need, and then you need to pray, and you need to ask Jesus to forgive you. Because that's what he's done for you. He died on the cross for you. And after a person is done, and we go through that prayer, and sometimes they pray on their own, and sometimes they ask me to pray, and they repeat what I have to say. And, and when all that is done, I look at them and I say, now, I want you to go tell somebody. You need to go tell somebody that you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. I truly believe that that's part of our testimony to others. That's part of our responsibility is to let people know that there's been a transformation in me. I'm a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. I'm going to go and I'm going to tell somebody. But, but pastor, they might think strangely of me. It's all right. You go and you live for Jesus Christ. Part of living for Jesus Christ. The Word of God says there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. I have a personal relationship with Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. Wow, I can go out and do whatever I want. That's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says, yes, there is no condemnation. I am no longer under the penalty of sin. I am no longer under the death threat of sin. God's taken that away. You know, one day we're all going to stand before Jesus Christ and we're all going to have to give an account for what you and I have said, have thought, have done as believers. Right. But, but wait a minute, Pastor. There's no condemnation. This is talking about our eternal state. I have a place that Jesus Christ is preparing for me. Why? Because he loved me. He died for me. Now, let's go on in Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, as you read through there, and we don't have time to read the first 11 verses, but jump down to verse 12. It says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, but uh, uh, to live according to the flesh. In other words, now we're not, we're, we, we, we don't owe the flesh anything. Why? Because we've been freed from the flesh. Where is our debt? Our debt is in Christ Jesus. It says, for if we live according to the flesh, you will die. But, according, uh, but if, if by the Spirit you have put to death the deeds of the body, and you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are what? The sons of God. That's how we have a relationship with God. We have a relationship with God. I can call Jesus. I can call the Creator of heaven and earth. I can call the, the, uh, the Jehovah Almighty. I can call um, Adonai. You know, whatever name you want to use for God. And we put names of God every, every week in our bulletin. And you can take any of those names and you can say, Lord, that's me, that, you are that for me. I am that I am is what he told Moses. And he says, listen, I believe that I can have a personal relationship with the I am 
Why? Because I'm his son, because he paid the price for me. And the word of God goes on here in verses, and down through that verse, it says in verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again unto fear, but you received the spirit, what, of adoption. Not only did he, did he save me, but now he's adopted me into his family, and he tells me that I can cry out, Abba, Daddy, Father, I can call him my father. That is who we're praying to. That was a long explanation, wasn't it? For what Jesus says there in, in Matthew chapter 6 in verse, um, in verse 9. Our Father who art in heaven. It's a relational prayer. Okay? There's a second thing we need to understand if we're going to glorify God through that. Okay? Is that it's not only a relational prayer, but it's a reverential prayer. It's a reverential prayer. It's a prayer that gives him honor. Notice what it says there in, in Matthew chapter 6 in verse, um, in, verse, um, in verse 9. In verse 9, at the end of verse 9, it says, Hallowed be thy name. Holy is your name. We're talking about here how God is unique and different. How he's set apart from anybody else. We need to hold him in, in homage. We need to hold him in, in, in glory. We need to lift him up in reverence. We need to recognize, listen, when we come into the presence of the Lord, we come into his, in, into his holiness. And we need to be like Isaiah who said when he, went in, when he saw the holiness of God, Woe unto me, I'm a sinner. Praise the Lord, I can go into the presence. And we're told by, um, in, in Hebrews, two times in Hebrews, that we have the boldness. We have the right and we have the, uh, and God expects us to go right before the throne of grace. You and I can do that. Why? Because we're children of God. But you know something? We don't come flippantly before God. You know, and, and, and sorry if you do this, but you know, he's not the man upstairs. That's right. Amen. That's disrespectful. He is our daddy. And we love him. And we give him respect due unto his name. And that's how we pray. Lord, we come to you in reverence. It's not just a reverence, okay? And um, you want to uh, you you want to look at a verse for that in uh, in First Corinthians ten verse thirty one. It says this. It says, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all what to the glory of God. Do all to the reverence of God. Do all for Him. My friends, is that how we act before God? But there's a third thing. There's a, it's a submissive prayer as we. Glorify God. We need to understand that Jesus is saying right here in this text. Look what it says in verse 10. It says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, there's a recognition here that he is the one who can get things done. We are willing to be submissive to the sovereignty of God. Remember, uh, remember when Jesus was um, brought to the temple the first time to worship I'm not talking about as an infant. I'm talking about as a child. His, his, he had finally gotten to the age where he'd go to the Passover. And his mom and dad had brought him up to Jerusalem. And, and they celebrated the Passover. And they celebrated all the feasts. And they were on their way home. Three days into their journey, they recognized, where is Jesus? Man, I tell you what. You know, if, if, I, was, if I was entrusted with the Son of God, I would sure want to know where he's at. I'd keep my eye on them a little bit, wouldn't you? You know, you do that with your own kids. Jesus was lost. So they run back to Jerusalem. You know, I can, I can picture Mary all upset and Joseph, you know, oh no, where is, where, where is this child? And the Word of God says that after searching, they find this young man in the temple ministering to the scholars. And he spoke with authority. They were amazed. Here's this 12-year-old uneducated kid from Galilee. From, sorry, from, from Nazareth of all places. And he's speaking this way. And they were all amazed. And remember when, when his mother finally got his attention and said, you know, come on, let's, let's go. And, and I can imagine Mary and Joseph. Now, why did you do this? And, and remember what Jesus said. You should have known where I was. Because I'm here to do my father's what? My father's will. My father's business. If we're the children of God, 
Shouldn't we be about the Father's will? Our prayer should not be, Lord, this is what I want. Our prayer should be, Lord, let your will be done. But, but Pastor, you don't understand. I have this cancer that, I need to, that needs to be cured. I can tell you this. Living with cancer in the will of God is better than being healed from cancer outside the will of God. Do you understand what I just said? But Pastor, you don't understand. Cancer is really bad. Yes. But being in the will of God is the perfect place for the believer. And my friends, that's where you and I need to be. And I think as we look at this prayer, we can learn something as Christians today. As we go to the Lord in prayer, the first thing we need to do is glorify God. Lord, I want to give you honor. I want to give you glory. I want to be submissive to your will. Lord, I want to, uh, you know, I, I just want to recognize that you are my Father. You are my God. You are my King. You are the one that has done it all. And Lord, I come to you humbly before your throne. And, and you know, it's not just, Lord, thank you for this grub. Amen. You know, we need to understand that there's a thought process and a reverence that goes into it. That's the first part. Remember I said there's, there's three parts. The second part, as we, uh, as we look at this, is we pray to bring petitions to God. I, I, I think the second reason why we pray, okay, is to bring petitions to God. See, in the Lord's Prayer, there are three verses, in verses 11 down to verse 13, gives us three petitions. It gives us three things. The first thing it talks about, okay, is for God's protection. Or, what can I say, favor? We can use the term favor here. We pray for favor or for protection. God, I'm uh, sorry, provision, not protection. We pray for pr provision. My wife is shaking her head. That's better. <laughs> Okay, God takes care of us. Notice what it says in the, in the Lord's Prayer. Okay, verse, uh, verse 11. Okay, it says this. Give us this day our daily bread. Is, uh, is Jesus saying we, 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 we have to ask Jesus for everything we have? I believe the answer is yes to that. Everything we have belongs to the Lord. Everything he gives us belongs to him. I think we need to ask him for all things. I think that's very clear here. Okay, but I don't think it's only for bread. I think it's for any type of things that he gives us. Lord, I'm bringing my petition for you to provide for me. You know, Lord, however you want to take care of me, I want you to provide. The first petition we give or we ask is that, is that, that petition for, uh, for, for favor from him. And you know, I tend to believe that this favor requires, requires faith. What I mean by that, when I trust the Lord to provide for me, there has to be faith to say, okay, Lord, you are going to do what it's going to take. I mean, think about this. Matthew chapter 14, Matthew chapter 15, both talk about the feeding of the multitudes. Uh, I think it's in 14, it talks about the feeding of the 5,000. In chapter 15, it talks about feeding of the 4,000. Folks, there are two different instances of miracles that Jesus did in his earthly ministry. They're not the one and the same. Feeding the 5,000, feeding the, of 4,000. In both instances, we find that they only, had a, a, they only had, in the first one, five loaves of bread, in the second one, seven loaves of bread. In the first one, they had two fish. In the second one, they had a few, a few fish. So there's a little bit more. Think about this. You're a disciple of Christ. There are 5,000 men. The Word of God uses the term men. We believe there's probably closer to eight or nine or possibly 10,000 people there. Okay, be counting the women and the children and, and all that. Okay, and so, so Jesus comes to you and says, okay, I, I, I have compassion on these people. I don't want to send them home without food. We're going to feed them. You're going to feed 10,000 people. Lord, how are we going to do this? We don't have anything. Just imagine their thought. I have to run to the store and buy food for 10,000 people. There's not enough carts around to, for us to bring food back. Lord, what are we going to do? And then I can imagine, you know, 
And, and it, it was probably Judas who said, but Lord, we don't have that much money. He kept the purse. Now, if he's the one who said that, uh, I know Scripture tells us which one he said it, but I can imagine Judas is now counting the bills, uh, the coins, sorry. He's counting the coins and he's saying, listen, there's no way this much money feeds that many people. What are we going to do? And Jesus says, trust me. Trust you, Lord. How are we going to do that? There's no way, Lord, this is possible. There's no way that what we have can meet the needs of what... And Jesus says, well, what do we have? Lord, we have nothing but enough for a little boy's lunch. A few fish. I can imagine they were probably little sardines or little, little, little fish. You know, there's not much to it. That he would put between a couple, of those, a couple, a couple pieces of bread or, or, or matzah or whatever it was, and, and boom, that would, that would keep this kid... You know, from starving, and mom packed his little lunch, and he's, he's, you know, and, and this is my imagination running. He skipped school to go find Jesus, and he has this little lunch that his mom packed for him, so he could have lunch at school, and, and now he's there, and he's, he, he's, he's the only one who had this lunch, and um, at least he was the only one who was willing to offer the lunch to Jesus, and, 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 and what are we going to do with this little boy's lunch? It's barely enough to feed this little boy. And we have now 10,000 people that we're going to... Lord, what are we going to do? Now anybody who's asleep is wide awake. <laughs> Jesus says, trust me. Trust me. Bring it here and let me pray. And you know, I don't picture Jesus' prayer by saying, Lord, you need... My Father in heaven, you need to send man down from heaven to feed these people. I don't believe he prayed that way. I think his simple prayer was, Lord, thank you for what you've given me. And I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. And he starts breaking the bread. Starts breaking it. Starts breaking it. Starts breaking it. And then they're passing it out. They're passing it. Breaks the fish. Cuts the fish. Breaks it. And breaks it. And everybody, 10,000 people, eat from this loaf. And then the Word of God says they collect the leftovers. It's not just a few loaves of bread and a few fish. Twelve baskets. Why twelve? I believe it was one for each one of those disciples. As a testimony to them, listen, if you trust me, I can take a little bit and I can provide for you. I can show you favor and I can make sure that you have what you need. The Word of God has promised that the Word, the, you know, Philippians chapter 4, if I'm not mistaken, in verse 13, says, My God shall supply all of your needs according to His riches, not ours, according to His perfect will. We need to understand that, that as we go to pray and bring our petitions before, before the Lord, the first petition has to be, Lord, I want favor from you. Lord, you provide. You, you take care of me, and I'm going to trust you. And if that's just a little bit or if that's a lot, I'm going to trust you. I don't know where tomorrow, what tomorrow holds, but you know something? God has never promised to provide for tomorrow. He has promised to provide for today. So walk today trusting him to know that he will take care of our tomorrow. You know, we, we in America have a tendency of saying, and, and, and I'm not saying this isn't biblical, I think we need to take care of our old age. Okay, the Word of God says that a man who doesn't provide for his family is worse than an infidel. I get that. But I think we're always looking at what tomorrow is going to hold. I'm going to, put away, I'm going to put away for tomorrow, I'm going to put away for tomorrow, I'm going to put away for tomorrow. Guess what? God provides us for our tomorrow. Trust Him. Okay? He, he tells us the second petition is not just for favor, but the second, uh, second uh, petition is for forgiveness. And notice what He says there in our text. And I have to really move a lot faster than what I'm doing. Okay? In verse, uh, in verse 12, it says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. I think the second petition has to be a petition of forgiveness. Lord, forgive me. Lord, I was wrong. Lord, I've sinned. We talked about this in our Monday night Bible study, but do you realize that God does not hear the prayers of a person who hides iniquity in your heart? If you have sin in your heart that hasn't been confessed, God will not hear you. But pastor, I pray every day. 
If you do not have, if you have sin in your heart that has not been confessed, God will not hear you. Really? Psalm 66, verse 18. If I regard the iniquity in my heart, God will not hear you. That's what God promises. That's right. Why? Because sin separates me from God. The only prayer that an unsafe person prays that God hears is the, or at least the first prayer that God hears of an unsafe person is the prayer of salvation. Lord, save me. After that, the door is wide open. He's our Father. Now he says, ask. But we need to make sure that sin is dealt with. And here in our text, we find that um, that I think this, this idea of salvation is talking about uh, salvation, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, forgiveness, it's talking about forgiveness unto salvation, it's also talking about forgiveness unto restoration, when he says, hey, forgive us. Okay, but there's three things about forgiveness that needs to be understood. Number one, it's an act of the will. It's your choice to forgive. Will you forgive that person who was offended you? Will you forgive that person? Will you seek forgiveness for your own sin? It's a choice you make. No, I'm not going to do that. I am too happy in, in, in being angry with this person because they did this to me that I'm going to stay angry and I'm not going to forgive or I'm not going to seek forgiveness. They deserved it. They deserved it. You know that guy you pushed off the road as you went by them because they cut you off and so you got angry with them and you sped up and then, you know, I had a guy, I had a guy yesterday, we were coming home uh, last night and um, we were on uh, uh, 252 coming, coming back from the King of Prussia area and uh, we were, you know, and, and I, you know, I, I, I pulled, I, actually I cut somebody off, I felt really bad about that, okay, and then, uh, then I'm driving along and all of a sudden this guy out of nowhere is on my bumper. First thought I had in my mind is, I'm going to hit my brakes. <laughs> yeah, let's see what happens. <laughs> and then I said, no, Lord, I'm going to move over and let him pass me. Amen. And then as he passed, I thought, I'm going to get on his bumper. <laughs> <laughs> no, Lord, I can't do that either. Okay, but, but, but we have a hard time, isn't that with... I want to get even. I want to get, I, I, you know, wait a minute. God says forgiveness. It's an act of my will. I can choose to forgive. I can choose not to forgive. And the Word of God tells us here that we need to forgive. Um, you know, and, and, and there, there are many, many verses, but look at, look at verse 14. Verse 14 talks about forgiveness in verses 14 and 15. It says, but if you forgive. The term if here implies that you can forgive or you don't have to forgive. But if you do forgive, God has promised to bless you. Okay, there's a second thing with regards to forgiveness. Forgiveness is based on unmerited favor. Uh, forgiveness is based on unmerited favor. I didn't, I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. They don't, God gives us, God withholds what we deserve and he gives us what we don't deserve. That's grace and mercy. Okay, we need to understand that the Word of God teaches us right here that we need to, as, as we seek forgiveness, it's not something that other people earn. It's not something that other people work for. You know, Pam does something, and I'll use my wife as an example. She's always picking on me, poor pastor. <laughs> you know, and she does something to me. Okay, she just, my responsibility is to forgive her even if she comes to me and says, Randy, I want forgiveness. She doesn't earn it. She doesn't deserve it. She doesn't, you know, that's exactly what Christ did for us. Um, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32 tells us this, and I love this verse. Okay, it tells us this. It says this, And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Un unmerited. Okay, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9, it tells us, For by grace are you saved through faith. And not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. You cannot earn God's forgiveness. But God says, listen, we need to forgive. And just as God forgives us, we need to forgive others. Why? Because we're his children. 
And he says, listen, this is how I do it. I expect you to do it the same way. Okay, and then finally, the third, the third aspect of this forgiveness is forgiveness does not keep records of offenses. If you're truly going to forgive somebody, get rid of that little black book that has all those offenses down that somebody offended you with. Get rid of them. Burn them. Jesus, God says, I take your sin. When you ask for forgiveness, I take your sin as far as the east is from the west. I don't remember it anymore. I buried it in the deepest sea. You know, I've said this at the Bible study. I said, if God were to say, I don't remember your sin anymore. God forgot something. If God forgets something, God's not God. God doesn't forget. He, doesn't, he just doesn't hold it to your record anymore. He says, listen, listen, it's not written down in my book anymore. I've, I've erased it. I've taken care of it. Why? Because he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. That's what God has promised. Listen, that's the forgiveness that you and I ought to have. We need to have that forgiveness. We need to make sure we have that. And, and I have no time to look at that last. Uh, let me give you the last petition, just so we get through the petitions. The last petition is for deliverance. Yeah, the, the, the verse 13 says, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. You know, there's this deliverance from evil. Our petitions, we need to understand that, uh, that, that this, this third petition, the first petition, if you remember, is for favor in verse 11, for forgiveness in verse 12, and finally for deliverance there in verse 13. We will, when, we, we will get back to uh, the rest of this when, later on, but uh, you know, we need to understand that if we're going to pray properly, we need to have a prayer that pleases God. Okay? Part of that prayer has to be a prayer of forgiveness. Let's close with a prayer. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the privilege of studying your word. And Lord, I ask that, Lord, you would just help us to be people who learn to pray, who are respectful to you as we come to you in prayer, that we would glorify you. But Lord, but secondly, that we would bring our petitions before you. And Lord, proper petitions. Why? Because you're the fairest of them all. Lord, I do thank you. Let us learn to be righteous in our prayer life. I do thank you in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The uh, handbells are going to come at this time, and uh, we'll leave us.